Hi, everyone. I'm Michelle Cobb. I'm the publisher of Audiophile Magazine, and I'm super excited to bring this group together today. Uh, we have some fantastic narrators talking about hearing history with Black voices and sponsored by our friends at Naxos Audiobooks. Now, as with all audiophile webinars, we have that exciting moment where you, the at-home virtual audience, gets to ask a question of our narrators. You'll notice that there's a Q&A box and a chat box. It's the Q&A box you want to focus on. That's where you should put your questions so that we might see them. All right, let's get started and introduce who we are going to be talking to today. And once again, thank you to Naxos. First up is Leon Nixon. He's an award-winning audiobook narrator, a director, a filmmaker, and a playwright. And he was a former police captain who retired after 30 years of public service. Plus he has a Juris Doctor and a bachelor's degree in business. He is one of the busiest career people I've ever met to be able to say all that. Um, but he is an audiobook narrator since 2016, and he's narrated over 100 audiobooks. Plus, he likes to improvise. He trained uh, in that in Los Angeles and Chicago. And I love this fact. He is part of a group that is in the Guinness Book of World Records for longest continuous, continuous improv show at 150 hours. I sincerely hope you guys to take a nap during somewhere in there. <laughs> All right. Next up is the beautiful golden voiced Robin Miles. She is a producer, director, actor with 25 years of experience in theater and audio performance. She's garnered the industry's top honors, including Audi Awards for best solo performance. Very recently, in fact, last year, and of course, as I mentioned, she is an audiophile golden voice. And her work has been from Broadway, television, audiobooks, film, museum installations, ADR, and commercials. You can tell all of our guests today are people that like to do a lot of different things. Plus, she teaches and she teaches acting and speech at Pace University and UCSD. And she owns Vox Expertise, a New York production and training studio. All right, next up, the gorgeous Dion Graham from HBO's The Wire, and he also narrates the first 48 on A&E. He, too, is a golden voice and an award-winning and critically acclaimed actor and narrator. He's been in Broadway, off-Broadway, internationally, in films, and several hit television series, and his performances have been praised as thoughtful, compelling, vivid, and full of life. And next up, the newest of our gang here, Tyla Collier is a New York-based actor, singer, dancer, award-winning audiobook narrator, and VO artist. This is the gang that I want to be part of with these fantastic audiobook people. She holds a BFA in musical theater from the Boston Conservatory and is represented by the Mine Agency. She's performed off-Broadway and at numerous regional theaters around the country. She has several titles on Audible, and she recently voiced five characters in a new video game. All right, I'm tired just saying all that, but I will remind everyone we do record this and you can find the recording of this next week here on our YouTube channel. I will also remind you, we have two podcasts. First of all, there's Behind the Mic, where we get to actually talk about a lot of the audiobooks that these fantastic voice talents record. And we also have a podcast called Audiobook Break, and that's where we do a serialization of an audiobook. And we've got something coming up for Valentine's Day, a little bit of pride, maybe a little bit of prejudice, a little bit of Jane Austen. So check that out uh, coming up soon. All right, that's enough of me. Let's bring everyone together and find out everything that's been going on in their world of audiobooks. I'm going to start off by having our friend Leon Nixon read from My Bondage and My Freedom by Fred Frederick Douglass, uh -huh. and this was produced by Naxos Audiobooks. So we're going to kick off with him doing a reading. We're going to ask some questions, and I'll remind you one more time, if you have a question for any of these fine voice talents, please put it in the Q&A box, not the chat box. 
Leon, the floor is yours. Oh, I'll take it. Thank you. Living here with my dear old grandmother and grandfather, it was a long time before I knew myself to be a slave. I knew many other things before I knew that. Grandmother and grandfather were the greatest people in the world to me. And being with them so snugly in their own little cabin, I supposed it to be their own. Knowing no higher authority over me or the other children than the authority of grandmama, for a time there was nothing to disturb me. But as I grew larger and older, I learned by degrees the sad fact that the little hut and the lot on which it stood belonged not to my dear old grandparents, but to some person who lived a great distance off and who was called by grandmother, old master. I further learned the sadder fact that not only the house and lot, but that grandmother herself, grandfather was free. And all the little children around her belonged to this mysterious personage called by grandmother with every mark of reverence, old master. Thus early did clouds and shadows begin to fall upon my path. Once on the track, troubles never come singly. I was not long in finding out another fact, still more grievous to my childish heart. I was told that this old master, whose name seemed ever to be mentioned with fear and shuddering, only allowed the children to live with grandmother for a limited time. And that in fact, as soon as they were big enough, they were promptly taken away to live with the said old master. These were distressing revelations indeed. And though I was quite too young to comprehend the full import of the intelligence and mostly spent my childhood days in gleesome sports with the other children, a shade of disquiet rested upon me. Thank you, Leon. Of course. That was fantastic. So I have a, a question for you sure. um, because this is a historical figure and we're, we're going to deal with a, a lot of different historical figures today. Mm. So it's not someone that you have heard a recording of his voice. So how did you create a voice for Frederick Douglass? Uh, I thought mainly, who is he as a person, as a human being, right? Part of my process is really listening to authors and kind of seeing their voice or whatnot. But for him, I didn't, you're right. And so I just thought, who is he as a human being? Why, why is Mr. Douglas writing this? To whom is he writing it to? And so as I read it, I kind of got a sense of who he is, who he was. And so I figured no one's gonna know what he sounded like. So I'll just be this person, this man, in these, this boy, man, in these circumstances, just live in that circumstance and just deliver it how I'm feeling. And I, I didn't worry about a voice so much, other than my voice being neutral and trying to stay consistent. But I wanted to deliver what he was going through in that moment every single time. And because no one ever knew what he sounded like, I didn't have to worry about his voice being high or low or fast or slow. Just if I lived in the moment and did what was happening in, in the scene in that moment and just lived how he was feeling there, I figured that would be okay. Well, I think I can honestly say now, when I think of Frederick Douglass, I would think of your voice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, that's an honor. So I'm gonna flop things over here to Mr. Dion Graham, because I know you've done this. When you are speaking in the voice of someone who has had their verse recorded and you've maybe heard that, how do you give listeners authenticity without mimicry? You'll have to unmute first, however. <laughs> Thank you, sorry. Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, I always try to just lean to, lean towards uh, whoever it is that, that's being brought to life or being channeled, <clears throat> excuse me, without trying to, Mm. without trying to in particular uh be a mimic of it but you know there's all kinds of things um that can you know be at your disposal um just being open to uh whatever creative creative impulse but i try to lean towards it and what leon said was i think really key is you know just want to try to be open to what you're getting from the writing about who this person is some people are very much 
in the public imagination and that, you know, you've seen them like Miles Davis, Muhammad Ali. So uh, there are some, some things if you can immerse yourself uh, and I try to do that uh, in the material ahead of time that I find useful uh, in doing that. Thank you. What about you, Robin? Anyone you've had to play that you've had some tools at your disposal as it were? I'm not sure um, if I call them tools just because they don't feel that formed. It feels more instinctual. But if I have to do a voice for somebody who's real, whose actual <laughs> voice imprint is out there, um, I will spend some time listening to interviews. And all I'm really listening for is how they are, like quickness of thought, quickness of mind, or, you know, everything's moving fast, or maybe more considered, that kind of thing. So how does their mind work? How do their thought patterns happen? That's all I really kind of need to know, because I'm not going to try and copy the timbre of their voice, the sound of their voice. But I do, if someone's expressive, I do want them, the reading to be expressive. So they use a big pitch range. Okay, I can do that too. Um, and if uh, it's usually the speed of thought and the way thoughts come to them that for me, I find most, most useful, so that I'm not trying to, I'm, I'm not being a mimic. And Tyla, I'm curious because you've you've done some real people and of course a lot of characters you talked about doing video games. I want to know which one is more challenging. Hmm. Um, I would say a real person whose voice we know, um, just because automatically when you you hear the person, you you automatically know who the person is. So I think people are more in, inclined to be like, okay, does it sound like that, or is she kind of you know sounding? like the real person, so yeah. Thank you. All right, some, some fascinating insights. And I think that for those of us in the public who are not recording audiobooks on a regular basis, we're, we're getting some idea of some of the interesting challenges that you have to have, especially with these historical titles. So thank you for all of that. All right, I'm going to turn things over to Robin Miles, who never fails to remind us that she's in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to, I haven't she's even going to started yet. <laughs> I see where I am. <laughs> she's going to read to us from You Don't Know Us Negroes and Other Essays by Zora Neale Hurston, Henry Louis Gates Jr., Genevieve West, who did the editing and introduction, and published by Harper Audio. And I'll remind everyone as people are doing these readings and we're asking some questions, feel free to put any questions in the Q&A box. Robin, take it away. You don't know us Negroes. The decade just passed it was the oleomargarine era in Negro writing. Oleomargarine is the fictionized form of butter. Like the gopher in the Negro folk tales about God, the devil and the highland turtle, it will go for gopher butter. Margarine is yellow. It is greasy. It has a taste that paraphrases butter. It even has the word butter printed on the label often. In short, it has everything butterish about it, except butter. And so the writings that made out they were holding a looking glass to the Negro had everything in them except Negroness. Some of the authors meant well, the favor was in them, they had a willing mind, but too light behind. 246 years of outward submission during slavery time got folks to thinking of us as creatures of tasks alone. When in fact, the conflict between what we wanted to do and what we were forced to do intensified our inner life instead of destroying it. We developed a turtle shell. So when folks come feeling around, they find something smooth and round and simple on the outside, like the six blind men who felt all over the elephant. But if more had been known about us, this mistaken simplicity never would have got abroad. Thank you. Oh, now you have to unmute. Now, see, now I have to unmute, yes. <laughs> That, that, that's the, the difficulty with these excellent readings is I get so caught up, I forget I have to do something next. <laughs> um, but some lovely comments in the chat about uh, your expressions and all of that. 
And I have a, a question for you. Zora Neale Hurston was well regarded as a collector of oral histories. And I think you've gotten to know her pretty well because you've done several of right. her titles. So if you could meet her, interview her, talk to her, what would you ask her? Oh, goodness. Uh, a couple of different things. I would ask her in her time, what has she seen return cyclically of our cycle of progress and slipping back and progress and slipping back? Because I know I'm now at an age where I can actually say I've seen rights and progress now slip back in a cycle that I exist in. And I would ask her, what has she seen happen? I, I know historically that those things have happened when it came to voting rights, it went forward and then came back. Um, desegregation of schools and you'd have a law passed and within three or four years that that law had been completely subverted. So I would be curious to know the what has been the greatest backslippages and how did the people of her time regard it and handle it? Because I feel like I could really use some learning from people who came before me. Wow. What do you do, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yes, it, it seems like we have a lot of lessons to learn from history. And I, I, I feel you, uh, your emotion when you talk about, you know, moving forward and moving back. And isn't it interesting in this particular time that we're in, that we're experiencing all of those things when we are able to be together in a different way, uh, virtually, I think that it, yeah. it's... I'm fascinated by this. Okay, I won't, I won't stick on it though. That's all good. Um, Tyla, mm -hmm. if all of these black leaders sat down to dinner together, what do they think, what do you think they talk about? You, you gave us the book about uh, Black Panthers, which we'll talk about later. So you have some uh, in insights into a variety of people. Uh, if they were all sitting together, I honestly think that they would be talking about what they can do to help us progress further. I think all of the um, people have spent their lives dedicated to the fight and the advancement of Black people as a whole. And I think that if they were together, they would continue on that fight. And yeah. Leon, I'll ask you to jump in on that question as well. Yeah, I, you know, I agree with Tyla. And I, I think that all of these leaders, iconic for sure, but what they all share is optimism, right? And I think that they would all sit around and, and the temptation is to say, well, oh, woe is me, why is this happening? I think they would all sit around and say, okay, look, what can we do? What can we do? What can, who can we talk to to push this forward? How can we use our status, our stature, you know, our, our, our presence? How can we use who we are and what we have to move all of this nonsense out of the way and move the entire world forward. I think that's what they would, they, I think they would get together and strategize over dinner on how to move everything past the talking into the doing to make this world better. I like it. Yeah. All right. We're going to turn to some questions from the audience now. So Dion, I'll start with you. We are talking a lot about historical nonfiction today. What are some best practices in preparing to narrate such books? and preparing to narrate historical nonfiction. Yes. Um, well, probably goes without saying, make sure you read the book uh, <laughs> so that you can so that you can actually take the journey and, uh, you know, find yourself in it. Otherwise, I would say what I think is really important is to, you know, allow yourself to be familiar with anything that you don't know, um, the history of the time, um, and allow yourself to be open to what that brings up in you um, and what you understand it's bringing up with people at large or the people that are being talked about in the book. And then um, I think, you know, just try to be open to the um, creative impulses that you're getting without overthinking it and, and to follow that as you tell the story that's being told in the book um, to, take us, to take us all on the journey uh, with you that the authors have written. I think that's really important. 
So those are, those are some practices that I, I try to jump into and employ. And Robin, I'll ask you in the follow-up, how much additional historical context do you seek when you're recording? You're muted. <laughs> My turn. <laughs> um, additional historical context. I will say that I have not had to seek much additional for two reasons. One, I tend to do like this time period between the mid to late 1800s and the 1940s over and over and over again. Even, even on stage, I did three penny opera set in the 1920s. I did, you know, I mean, a lot of plays that I've done seem to have been set in that time period and so you know who was president calvin cool calvin coolidge and during you know cert this this year and this year um so i haven't had to do i think quite as much um but i'm a saver of articles i might google something about a time period um recently the five points neighborhood in new york and the intersection of the black community and the Irish community has come up in three different books. And so I've actually had my research in a way done for me by the fact that the things that are around me, and maybe this is a subject matter beat, maybe we're all just curious about this at the same time and writers are writing it. Um, but I will Google five points or what I did was I went down to the um, Central Park Conservancy on 110th Street and they have a they have a, like a whole booklet on the five points neighborhood. So I'll do that kind of ancillary work. Mostly it's Google, especially these days. Well, it feels like you, you get an education as you're um, right. narrating. And, and oftentimes it's really the vocabulary within um, a nonfiction historical work that um oh my god i go down the rabbit hole on those i'm looking up a pronunciation or a word that's not familiar and then i say i, I need to know more about it i'm going to speak the word i need to relate to the word so i will do that um Fantastic. much much time is spent down that rabbit hole <laughs> and michelle i think i think what you really what you said before was really important is that you are getting an education through reading through these books through reading the book and through bringing it to life um to certainly getting an education over and over again, like you just said, Robin. Yeah. Mm. All right, Tyla, question for you. What is a unique audiobook challenge that you've encountered and how did you solve it? Um, hmm. I guess I'll talk about one, I mean, with this current book that I'm gonna be talking about, um, a challenge was definitely that there are some parts of the book that are emotionally taxing and heavy uh, so I, the challenge is, you know, how do you get through reading that without, you know, getting emotional, voice cracking, get whatever. Um, so for me, I, when I know that I'm going to have a hard section, I will try to practice reading it out loud, just that standalone section a couple of times, just to work through how I'm feeling about it and be able to come at it from a factual place, um, not completely removing the emotion, but at least suppressing enough of it so that I can get the words out um, without breaking down. So yeah, that's definitely a challenge that I've had to overcome. Well, we love hearing the emotion in everyone's voice here. So we appreciate that you hold it back, but also that you are experiencing it along with the listener in many ways. All right, we're gonna pivot back to the next reading and we'll come back to more audience questions. Next up, I'm going to turn to Dion Graham, who's going to read from Letter from Birmingham Jail by Martin Luther King Jr. and published by Christian Audio. I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere, is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutually, mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow, provincial, outside agitator idea. 
Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. You deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I am sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. I am sure that none of you would want to rest content with the superficial kind of social analysis that deals merely with effects and does not grapple with underlying causes. It is unfortunate that demonstrations are taking place in Birmingham, but it is even more unfortunate that the city's white power structure left the Negro community with no alternative. Well, it's fascinating that we actually get to hear you talk about playing a historical character whose voice we know well, and then you demonstrate that. <laughs> so thank you for that. I'm curious, did you discover anything that you hadn't known about Martin Luther King Jr. as you are narrating this famous letter? That's a really, really good question. Um, I'm not sure. Here's what I certainly was reminded of. Um, and what was brought into greater focus. Um, oftentimes the way that MLK has been presented is as a distinctly one side um, preaching nonviolence and uh, uh, sometimes seen in a passive light compared to another side of the struggle, which is people who are not there to simply turn the other cheek um, in the struggle and the march forward in the, in the continuing revelation of what relationships are um, between people and where we want to take them. But in fact, I think that Martin Luther King Jr. Um, was not simply in one side of, of uh, being passive about the struggle. In fact, he was quite uh, radical um, in many ways in terms of his thought and as his journey went on, um, I think the strategies that he employed and that he encouraged us to employ, along with all the other people who were also in Malcolm X, Stokely Carmichael, all kinds of people, um, really, really came into focus that he was neither saying this or that strictly. And that's something that um, in narrating this particular piece really, um, really came into focus for me um, as well. I was familiar with that. Um, in the first place, but it really, it really became into focus. And I guess this letter too also really made me think about and really revealed how even when you're trying to take a course of action for good, and people sometimes don't recognize and are willing to brush it aside or step on it, that it's important, as I think Martin Luther King was showing in this, to uh, step forward and call that out and say that there are other ways that we will go as well. So, a lot of those Fantastic. Things. All right, I'm just gonna let that rest for a second and turn things over to Leon. What did you learn about your subjects that surprised you when you were prepping the book? I, can I say this publicly? Yes, I will. I learned that Frederick Douglass is a badass. He just is. I mean, this dude, man, if you ever have any, you know, feeling of quitting, I can't do this. Why is this so hard? This dude, man, he fought from the moment he found out that he was not free. He fought from a child all the way to his freedom and beyond. And it surprised me because all through school, you know, you, we go through, you know, for me, if you're my age, you know, it's Black History Week and now it's Black History Month. But there was the little box in the corner with all the historical Black figures and you go and say, oh, Rosa Parks, you know, and, and, and Frederick Douglass and, you know, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. You know, we heard all of those things. And that was kind of it, right? But there was so much depth to Mr. Douglas that I was surprised to, to hear. I mean, I'll give you an example. He was, 
they sent him, he was so defiant, they sent him to what was called the Negro breaker, right? They sent him to this person with the Negro breaker. We're going to turn you around and make you behave. And through whippings and hard work, and, and he had had enough. He had had enough and fought this dude for like two hours, fought this Negro breaker for two hours. And what he learned from that, what it was a turning point in the book, and certainly for me, he said it was in that moment when he realized he was a man. And that moment he realized he needed to be free. And he fought from that moment on. That surprised me. And I'm telling you, it changed me because even today you think about, you know, what the heck is going on? I, wanna, I don't wanna do this. This dude fought, literally, literally fought for his freedom. Who are we to quit? Hmm. Wow, well. <laughs> I keep saying this uh, recently in, list, in my own audiobook listening, that I'm starting to learn things that I was never exposed to in history. And it's been really fascinating today to hear these little tidbits that you all are picking up and helping to convey to the rest of us so that we can learn these things and hopefully you know, progress as a society from these learnings. And I feel personally for myself and in, in, in having a, a child who is in school, there is a limited amount of material that we're given. There's a limited amount of things that we learn about people. And Tyla, I'm gonna turn things over to you for your reading because I think Revolution in Our Time by Kekla Magoon, which you'll be reading from, and actually yesterday was honored for both the, as a Prince honor book and a Coretta Scott King honor book from the ALA. When I listened to this title, I felt like the history that I had been exposed to in my life in a classroom was so limited that I had only learned one tiny piece of this puzzle uh, about the Black Panthers and I had not been given the full story. And I have to say thank you to all of you for being able to bring to life these books that help illuminate and teach us things that we weren't getting in our typical education system. And Tyla, this book is a young adult book, and I'm going to turn it over to you to uh, read from, and then we'll talk to you a little bit about it. But uh, I think it's a fascinating transition from Leon's. It made me think like we, we should move right into this because it's a great illustration of what we aren't getting and, and how um, incomplete our education as a society has been. The Panthers' main gatherings were political education meetings. The most important tools for liberation were intellectual engagement and mental freedom, not the carrying of weapons. They helped people learn to read and developed a recommended reading list for Panther recruits who were beyond the Little Red Book. Some of their favorite titles were The Wretched of the Earth by Frantz Fanon, a West Indian psychologist who wrote about the challenges of throwing off the colonial mindset, and Guerrilla Warfare, by one of the Cuban revolution leaders, Che Guevara. The sisters and brothers on the block flocked to the Panther political education classes. For many, it was the first time that education had felt relevant and exciting. Many came just to listen and learn. Those who had been initially attracted by the promise of guns discovered other, better reasons to stay involved in the movement. But only the most committed and passionate became official members of the Black Panther Party. The first Panther member, Lil Bobby Hutton, was promoted to treasurer even though the party coffers were quite modest in those early days. Funds were used to keep up the office headquarters and to provide bail and legal aid to Panthers who got arrested in the line of duty. Tarika Lewis became the first woman to join the party in the spring of 1967. She was a sophomore in high school, attracted to the Panthers because she could tell that they were doing a lot of good in the community. Following the Panthers' lead at Merritt College, Tarika helped to organize for a Black student program in her high school. Tarika's determination to join the movement convinced the founders that it wasn't just men who would be interested in fighting for their community. That is one of the things I loved about this particular title was, you know, learning about women in the Black Panthers. It's not something I'd seen before. Now, Tyler, this is a, a unique book because it's a history written for teens. 
How did you think about that audience and how did it influence you and impact your performance as you did it? So just thinking about teens, I think that um, they are more inclined to listen to a voice that sounds similar to someone who is their age or someone maybe a little older than them. Um, they're, I definitely think they're more willing to do that versus if they're hearing someone who sounds a little bit older, but who might remind them of a parent or a teacher, they're probably going to be more likely to tune it out or less willing to listen. So I tried to really lean into the natural youthfulness of my voice um, and just keep it engaging um, because it there is a lot of heavy stuff that, you know, as a teenager, you might be like, oh my gosh, I can't even think about this right now. Um, so just tried to keep it engaging and really interject my personal opinions about things to kind of make it come alive. Um, and then another thing that really did help as well with knowing that uh, my thinking was correct is that um, uh, the author actually, I was told that the author liked the youthfulness of my voice because she wanted it to really speak to them. Um, so that also helped me to know, okay, I, I, it is good to lean into that youthfulness. And I think you did exactly that. I, in my own listening to your title, I thought those two words stood at the forefront, um, engaging and youthful. So congratulations. <laughs> All right, Robin, what can you do in your role as a narrator to help, just like Tyler was doing, make this feel relevant to the audience and make it feel relevant to today? Um, I think each book for me is different. And certain books and certain kinds of writing will ask me to respond in one way. Other ones will ask me or ask to be responded to in another way. For instance, if something is extremely thick, intellectual, long sentence length, complex uh, concepts, I'll try and make it more and more like one half of a conversation and just speech like I'm talking to you. But I break it down into chunks to make sure they can follow me. Um, when it comes to nonfiction, I would almost use this metaphor. You're in your car and your friend is following you in the car on the highway. You can't just go over three lanes and get to the exit and they're supposed to follow you. You've got to actually keep an eye on how well they're following you, how close they are and take it. I say slow, but, um, I don't mean to slow down pacing so much as, um, make it clear where you're going so that they can clearly follow you. Um, other times I will step back from that conversational way because it's written so conversationally, I don't need to, I don't need to double down on that. Um, but I, what I do do to make things more, I, I think, comprehensible. And so they don't miss points is that I will I consider the dates date anchors. So I, I, sp I speak a date, it anchors me in time so that you know everything is here. And then there's another date which anchors me how many years ahead? Oh, four years ahead. So 1964, blah, 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 1968. So I'll anchor those things so that chronologically maybe they can go forward. Or I'm careful to lift and separate, <laughs> sounds like a play text, bro. Lift and separate um, antithesis antitheses one from another. Um, but I think about this is an essay, essentially a long extended essay. I used to teach essay writing for English as a second language. How is it organized? Because if I take them through how the writer organized it, then they know, oh, this is comparing and contrasting this, uh, this thing, or oh, this is a process, or I see we're going chronologically and learning how things move. So what I try and do is just acknowledge the underlying writing structure so that things don't get missed. That sounds so anal. No, no, it, it sounds like you're well prepared and that we are benefiting from your preparation. <laughs> so, so uh, Dion, Dion, I have a question for you since we're talking a little bit about uh, young people. And I know that you read a lot of books for young people. Do you know any initiatives to get young people involved in listening to books to get them more interested in reading history? Mm. Well, one initiative I'm very aware of is Think that happens every year, um, which you could talk more 
thoroughly about than I will, but I will say that Sync uh, via audio file um, offering free um, selections from various different realms for young people that I think is a, a tremendous thing and it's really um, well received. And basically I think that like at every opportunity, I think it's great to present um, audiobooks uh, and other realms too, but audiobooks to young people, some who I know myself as a kid, that's where I developed the extreme love of reading and just uh, uh, falling into that. And I think kids would are open to audio and you know reading um, as well. So I just think talking about as much as possible anytime you're together with kids or you're working with organizations like libraries, uh, professional organizations, just mm -hmm. putting it out there for them, I think is a good thing to do. Yes, and I did set you up well for that because um, Sync launches uh, April 28th. We're going to have 16 weeks of free audiobooks targeted to teens this year. Awesome. You can go to audiobooksync.com. We just announced the titles, for most of them in a blog post uh, recently, and the entire season, which turns over every Thursday. There's two new titles that come up. Uh, and you just have to have the Sora app. So go to audiobooksync.com, follow all the instructions. It's also a page, it's a page directly on the Audiophile website and introduce teens to all of these fantastic titles that are coming. It's a really wide variety. And we actually did a little preview in November. One of the titles read by the fantastic Bonnie Turpin is This Is My America. So it's, it's a great selection um, that we're offering this year. So please check it out. All right, Leon, a tougher question for you. All right. Do you think that COVID has made people more aware of many things, in including Black history? And when, <laughs> if, but I'll say when, when COVID fades away, uh, will it be considered a time that was good for human rights? Hmm. Mm, I don't think so. I don't think when COVID goes away, it will define one way or the other human rights, but I, because so many other things have happened, right? I mean, we've had people being killed at the hands of police and, you know, we have, you know, voter suppression issues happening. Those things are independent of COVID. But what I do think is COVID gave us, um, a deeper understanding of our need for connection. And I think that's gonna be the takeaway from all of this. You know, being isolated in your home, in your bubble, right? I mean, you say for better or for worse and you know, oh, we love each other. And, but when you have to stay in the same room, same house with someone for weeks at a time, <laughs> there's more worse than better for many people I've heard. Um, and so it's challenging. So you still need that connection to other human beings. I mean, energetically, I mean, to give you a sense of who I am spiritually, energetically, we are all connected. But still, as human beings, we need a physical connection. So um, I think that there, there are so many other things that are happening in the world that affect how we live, you know, how we treat each other, how we feel, which is, to me, the most important thing. How do we feel? Um, that I think that COVID has just exacerbated something, but not, not necessarily human rights. I think it's exacerbated a problem we have with connecting with each other. So I think the takeaway is gonna be, how much do we need each other? And what are we gonna do about it? You know, right? You can't hug anybody, you gotta have a mask on. There's all these things that are keeping you away. How do we get past that and just continue to love each other? And I think the takeaway from COVID is gonna be that. We need each other. And, once we get past all the other nonsense, that's we, that's what we all come down to, our human connection, the need to be together. Mm. Fantastic. I, I completely agree with that. I'm, I feel like I'm finding that um, all over, or I'm seeing it all over exactly the way you phrased that, Leon, mm. that um, we as a culture or as a society have completely forgotten how much we need each other, how much in, our interdependency, we really are interdependent. And, but because we have this um, hyperinflated sense of independence, I mean, independent and interdependent are, they're, they're not really, I wanna say they're not really compatible, but actually I think they kinda are. You can still be independent and interdependent on a community, but we've forgotten that, or maybe we never knew. I don't know. 
but I, I feel you on that. Yeah, thank you. Sure, we all are. For sure. You know, you can't throw a piece of plastic out without it ending up on somebody's beach. True. I mean, everything that we do affects everything else. Absolutely. Yeah. Right? It's one big butterfly effect. That's just kind of the way it works. So from audiobooks to butterflies. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm so impressed with all of you here today because uh, we're able to learn not just about the pro process of audiobooks, but I really appreciate how uh, giving you are all as human beings in terms of performance, but also in terms of, of sharing your heart with us today. So thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for Tyla because you're fairly new to this. And here we are talking about community and needing each other. In your career, have you ever felt the need for mentorship? And if so, how did you go about finding and building a mentor relationship to help you? Um, yeah, I definitely, uh, just so everyone knows, I've only been doing audiobooks for about a year now, um, which, yeah, so I am pretty new at it. And I started off in this program called The Great Audiobook Adventure, um, led by Elise Arsenault. And so that kind of gave me an instant community um, of other narrators who, you know, were going through the journey and all that kind of thing. So being able to have that support. We have a Facebook group, so I'm able to uh, connect with people that way. And then also, um, I mean, even just doing uh, something like this, I mean, all three of you, I will be definitely reaching out to all of you for, you know, um, mentorship and that kind of thing, because I think that that is really important. And for me to, you know, be here with the three of you, it is, you know, just so inspiring to me as a new narrator. Um, and yeah, it's just truly incredible. And then also I know, Michelle, you can talk about um, the APA mentorship program as well, um, which you know better than I do. So yeah, you can talk about that. Yeah, so one of the things that I think has come up recently, um, certainly around the pandemic and wanting to make sure that actors are aware that they don't have to have a stage, they can have a booth in their home, and they can do something that is really pandemic proof to um, build their career. So the Audio Publishers Association has started a mentorship program, you can go to audiopub.org and find out about it. And the idea is to build community of new narrators who have many things to learn. And I think, Tyla, you've been very lucky here on this sort of gold star panel. Uh, you've got some excellent narrators uh, to learn from and to have that mentorship opportunity. Um, Penguin Random House is also doing a mentorship program. And all of these things which are bringing us beautiful new talented voices such as yours, Tyla. Um, congratulations on just being a year into this and being uh, amongst the, the literati here of fine, fine narrators. Um, but yes, there's programs out there. And, you know, we've talked a little bit about COVID. And I love the fact that audiobooks, not only are they pandemic proof from the work side, but they're very helpful to build community and to build a connection to people, even if it's you're just by yourself listening to these wonderful voices in your ears. I know for me during the pandemic, that was certainly something that helped me get through it because I know that person sitting behind the mic telling me a story and I'm connecting to their voice. Mm. Which brings me to my next question for Dion. Has there ever been a character that has stuck with you or a personal favorite that you've done? Oh, wow. Uh, oh, wow, wow. Uh, <laughs> that's like choosing between my children, uh, which is very hard to do. Um, yeah. I mean, there have been, uh, there have been a number of favorites uh, from one significantly uh, between you and I, Michelle, Miles, uh, Miles Davis, um, himself I was a big fan of Miles Davis's before I narrated his autobiography but I was also thinking about I was thinking about um something I did recently um which was the every Dave Eggers new book the every which is a follow-up to his book the circle which is a a hilarious and serious um 
clarion call about how we are living with uh, technical and social media connections all the time. So the character in that book, Delaney, jumps out to me a lot. Um, there, there, there are just so many. I can't even say there's a book recently uh, called Dirty Bird Blues, uh, which is about to come out. Um, and it's a, it's a love story. Um, but it's a it's a man, it's a black man who is it's a 1949-ish who is very much um in love with his music. He's a musician, he's extremely talented, but he also loves his wife. But there's a lot of tension between how that plays itself out. So there there are just so many. Muhammad Ali, just just so many things in in spec fiction. Um I feel like a, a kid in the candy store to be able to, to, you know, just kind of swim around in all of that. Fantastic. All right. Um, Robin, I'm going to lob this tough question over to you. Have you ever been asked to read material that doesn't resonate with your spirit or personal beliefs? And how do you prepare for that? Or do you even take the gig? That's um, a, a top primo question. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, from two different standpoints. One, I early on, early career, um, I, I do romance. Um, romance is fun to do. Erotica is even fun to do. But you can go, I think, past erotica <laughs> um, into poor taste, <laughs> frankly. Um, and there's no amount of suspension of disbelief is gonna bring you to that area. Um, I came across a book that was, I was assigned a book or asked to do a book that was so raunchy, um, but I was in a bind. I needed my health insurance um, minimum. And I was a few weeks away. So I called and said, do you have a book you could toss me just to make sure I get, I gotta keep my family covered health insurance book comes in and by page four, I went, oh my. <laughs> and then by page 10, I went, oh my goodness. I called my mother, <laughs> honestly. I was like, mom, what do I do? I can't speak these words. Um, and what I ended up doing was there was this kind of rough and very entertaining woman in my neighborhood. And so I decided she could read this book. She could do that. She, that would be like, that's her personality. And so I just decided I would do the book as her so that it wasn't me doing the book. And I came up with a pseudonym. Um, that was the extreme sexual example. The other one that I find much more difficult really was religiously. Um, I've had a couple of books to do that, that promoted the position that if you're poor, you aren't right with God. And that if you're wealthy, it's because you're right with God and you're being rewarded. Um, prosperity Christianity is what I call that. Um, and I find it so abhorrent that I can't, I mean, I now ask outright if that concept is in there. And if the book attacks the LGBTQ community for their very existence, they are wrong, they are sinful, then I'm not going near it. So honestly, those are my two, those are my two boundaries. I don't want to assist in putting those two values into the world. And I do believe the power of the human voice does put things forth into the world. I don't want to help that manifest. I don't. So I gently, politely turn them down. But I did have to learn the hard way. I got the books didn't think to pre-read, started doing it. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. And now I've, uh, and then in the midst of a, of a book of three, I had to uh, choose a pseudonym. Um, I chose a pseudonym. I won't tell you what it is, but my, my initial reaction was, this is bull. And so I just made sure that my, my persona had a B and an S in the, in the initials. <laughs> that was my revenge. <laughs> So, you know, a very serious piece to your answer in there, but somehow I find that in all of these webinars, we do actually like find our way back into erotica. That seems to be a, a theme <laughs> that 
all narrators have to talk about. So um, we're going to end on a light note with kind of a, a lightning round question. And I'll, I'll mm -hmm. start with you, Leon. So you are all very well respected. You're professional. You're clearly passionate. But also, you must have some funny moments during recording. So do you ever capture your bloopers or keep a blooper reel, Leon? I don't. <laughs> It's funny. I, you know, I practice a lot um, it, uh, in between projects or I just kind of go in the booth for like 20, 20, 30 minutes and kind of just mess around and see what happens if I'm just no pressure and no deadlines, no nothing. No one's let, I just completely <laughs> let go and let, let it go free. And then I stop it and, you know, play it, download it and listen to it as I'm walking around the house. I listen to it and I'm like, or sometimes I'm like, oh yeah. And so I find out what works, but I don't save them. <laughs> <laughs> I listen and I delete. Um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm, I'm really conscious about what you put in the universe, right? What's out there. And so it, there's stuff in the universe that I'm proud of and stuff, stuff that I'm like, ah, I could have done better. But the blooper reels, I don't want in the universe. <laughs> so I delete them. Well, I know the, the Audio Publishers Association is doing a Facebook live um, you know, lead up into the Audis coming March 4th. And one of the sessions is going to be about bloopers. So I guess we will not be hearing anything from Leon Nixon. <laughs> oh no, if I'd have known that I would have saved something because it would have been fun to be in the mix. <laughs> Maybe the mix and we'll close with you, Tyla, as a newer narrator. Have you kept some of those bloopers? Um, no, I do not. <laughs> I do not. But I do listen back just before I delete them just to be like, oh, okay, that was funny. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I would like to thank each of you for sharing with us. And, you know, we are here about serious topic, but we also um, are here to have a good laugh. And we have done both today. So thank you to Robin, Leon, Dion, and Tyla, to the staff at Audiophile for putting this all together, to those of you watching, to the publishers who make these books possible, and of course to our sponsor, Naxos Audiobooks. We hope you all have a wonderful afternoon, stay healthy, stay connected, and please invite people to come back to Audiophile's YouTube channel next week to get more of these fantastic insights, let people know who weren't here, there's a lot to learn from. Thank you all and have a great day. Thank you so much for having us.